Hi, Carlo. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Um, except for the politics and the weather, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, that's, yeah, and the weather will change. <laughs> um, not the sure about the politics. Change, let, yes. let me introduce us. Um, I'm uh, Robert Wright, uh, Blogging Hits TV, and this is, in fact, The Wright Show. You are Carlo Stranger in Israel. You write a blog or column, whatever you want to call it, for Haaretz called Stranger Than Fiction. Uh, I imagine that pun works better in English than in Hebrew. Um, the, uh, and you're the author of The Fear of Insignificance, which is something I suffer from. Uh, but you've already counseled me on that in our previous conversation. <clears throat> did it help? Help. Didn't, did not help. Did, it, things only got worse. It's been a downward spiral ever since then, and that's why I need to check in. You are a psychiatrist. <laughs> you're, 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 in this case, you're one of my great therapeutic uh, failures. Uh, I hope I'm the only one. On the other hand, I'm probably the only one who wasn't paying you anything. And that's <laughs> and that may be why. Let me before you give me guidance and tell explain Israeli politics to me. I'm going to give you one piece of guidance, which is that when these uh, when these things get um, kind of when this goes on screen, the very margins of your video uh, will be cut out. So like right now, your right ear would be we would be missing your right ear. But now we've got the whole Carlo. Okay. okay. So. Um, when I saw I, I saw you in Israel, I think a year and a half ago, and we were both a little discouraged about the future of Israel for maybe somewhat different reasons. I don't think I've gotten less discouraged, uh, but why don't you tell us what uh, your concern is uh, and whether it's uh, lessened or intensified or what? Well. Uh, let me start uh, from, from on a purely subjective level. It's been uh, the last four years have been very difficult for uh, progressives in Israel uh, because this government has been consistently anti-liberal. There have been attempts at anti-liberal legislation, some of which came through, most of which were in the, in the last moment was blocked. There was, of course, a total lack of any political process vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Palestinians. And uh, in addition, there is a very tangible um, move to the right and, and an increasing degree of nationalism in Israeli public and political discourse that is really disquieting. Um, so that, in addition to the sense that uh, the center did the right religious block under Netanyahu is certainly geared to get another term um, uh, to, and will rule Israel for another, uh, we can't exactly know how long, but at least, let's say, two, three years, and that this might conceivably already be the end of the two-state solution because settlements will um, grow during that time. Uh, all that together doesn't exactly lead to, you know, uh, great optimism. No, I don't feel too optimistic. Can you give us, can, can, before you elaborate on that, can you give us an example of anti-liberal uh, legislation? In part because in America especially, people think of liberal as referring to kind of a left of center politics, which isn't quite what you mean. Okay, uh, so let me first make clear that what I mean by liberal uh, 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 I'm going to use liberal in the classical European se mm -hmm. sense, which means that uh, basically you take individual uh, rights as a given and uh, around which politics and law are being constructed. And then, of course, these individual human rights are equal uh, without regards to religion, ethnicity, sex, sexual orientation, or anything of that sort. Uh, the only, uh, actually, Israel in that respect is, is already is a very liberal country, at least when it comes to sexual orientation. It happens to be one of the most progressive, paradoxically, one of the most progressive countries in the world in this respect. But for example, there was an attempt by uh, the Knesset to uh, force left-leaning um, NGOs to disclose their funding. And the idea was that uh, they would lose their status as tax exempt uh, institutions. Right. And that was a blatant example because the, the political orientation was clearly stated 
in, in, in the legal proposal, which is um, unheard of in a liberal democratic uh, sense, in, in the uh, order in the classical sense. Uh, another attempt was uh, Lieberman's, the attempt of Victor Lieberman's until uh, two weeks ago for a minister who is now uh, potentially, who might be indicted um, for, uh, for indiscretion, for, for his conduct. Uh, to um, force Israeli citizens to give a, an oath of allegiance to Israel as a Jewish and democratic country. Now, unlike the U.S., where actually people do give it something like an oath of allegiance when they be, when they get the citizenship, here he went. Uh, he meant that every citizen would have to give it, and that was of course primarily directed at Arab uh, at Israel's Arab citizens. Um, and um, there were a number of other attempts of that sort. There uh, was now an attempt to close down the political science department at Ben Gurion ben University in Beersheba, in the south of Israel, uh, ostensibly because of some academic criticism, but clearly because it's very left-leaning. Um, so um, these are, you know, on, on a global scale, this may not be dramatic, but given that uh, Israel so far really prides itself justly that it is, a functioning liberal democracy. These are ominous signs if you take them as the beginning of something. And can you can you um, tell us what you think is driving any rightward drift? Now, uh, about fifteen or twenty years ago, somebody uh, said to me, I forget who it was. They said one thing that's happening in in Israel is that some of the more radical people are moving there, like from Brooklyn. And meaning radical right, and the more moderate people are leaving, and 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 they worried about a sheerly demographic uh, source of rightward drift. What what do you think that has anything to do with it? Oh, do you think that's even happening? And and do you think it has anything to do with it? And in any event, what else? What do you, what do you think is going on? Well, the the, the influx of radical radical left wing uh, Jews from Brooklyn is not. You, you mean you mean radical. Right, right. Excuse me. Radical, yeah. radical right wing uh, Jews from Brooklyn is negligible. That's not uh, the same function. Um, there is a problem, which is that the ultra orthodox and the national religions have a very, very high growth rate. We're talking in the uh, ballpark of eight children per couple, uh, whereas secular liberals tend to have, you know, around two children per couple. And that, of course, tips the balance uh, uh, to the right. But I think that the real reason lies somewhere else. Um, and it is very, very simple. It's fear. Uh, you see, there is a very... Uh, uh, let, me, let me give you the latest data that supports that uh, uh, thesis. You know, all, all along the last 12 or 30 years, there has been a consistent paradox, which is that when you poll Israelis, uh, more than two-thirds are in favor of a two-state solution. Um, but then they keep voting for parties that are the mind of that two-state solution. And uh, so the question is why, why, why that is happening. And while, you know, many of us were beginning to speculate that maybe a deep ideological radicalization was taking place in Israel, there's been an American-sponsored uh, poll that was done by two independent pollsters in parallel, and they got pretty much the same results, and they showed something that was not so surprising, which is that, again, more than two-thirds of Israelis would support an agreement with the Palestinians, uh, assuming that uh, security concerns would be taken care of, uh, which would include going back to the 67 borders with land swaps in where, you know, where the major settlement areas are, and that's the greatest surprise, they would be willing to, uh, for, to a partition uh, of Jerusalem, which is like the ideological uh, uh, thing. And that comes to what really surprised me and many other people. Fully 57% of voters of 
uh, the Kut Beitenu, which is this merger between uh, Netanyahu and Lieberman. And even more surprising, also, Abayta Yehudi, uh, which is like the real far right extremist religious ideological party headed by Naftali Bennett, who is a uh, who is um, was a very successful uh, startup uh, founder who, uh, who made a lot of money there and is a very charismatic young politician, fully 57% of those would support such an agreement. Hmm. So what you see is that that means that basically the reason why Israelis keep uh, voting to the right is not ideology. It is that uh, they do not believe that such an agreement can be reached, and if it is reached, uh, they are afraid that for the Palestinians it's just the first stage, and that they will uh, both infringe on Israel's security and that the uh, plan of, in the end, getting all of uh, the land uh, west of the Jordan as part of a larger Palestinian state will not, that they will not give up on that. Mm -hmm. so, so you're describing it as fundamentally a problem of fear. And uh, I think, you know, one thing you and I agreed on when uh, I was in Israel is that, you know, however um, counterproductive some Israeli behavior may seem from afar, um, and, and I think it has been, it's it's no more it, it it's it's no more kind of uh, I guess I'd say uh, it's no less justified than the than some things Americans did after 9/11. Um, in other words, uh, you know the the threat the grounds for feeling threatened are more ongoing in Israel uh, and, than than they ever were in America um, and. Yeah. And, and so it's understandable that fear plays a large role in the um, psychology. And, I, and you know, I, having talked to people who were there uh, during the Second Intifada, you know, they really testify that people really, you know, you, were, you know, pizzerias were getting bombed and stuff and not, not far from where they lived. And that just transforms the way you think. Um, it seems to me you can also describe it as a problem of trust. Uh, you, you know, in other words, you're saying... They they don't be, they they by and large don't believe that the Palestinians in the long run will settle for a two state solution that there will always be lurking there a larger design of putting an end to the Jewish state and, and then taking over all the land right you know, well, I think, you know Israelis have a really simple question that's what most you know most Israelis are no more sophisticated. That politically than most people on earth. But they have a very simple uh, concern and a very simple question. They said, we, went, we withdrew from Gaza, and what we got was constant rocket barrages on the south of Israel. That's because Hamas controlled it, and Hamas in the past has won elections in, uh, uh, in Palestine, in the Palestinian Authority. How can you guarantee us that if we withdraw from the 1967 borders, we will not be in a completely catastrophic situation? If you look at Israel's map and you look at the the West Bank, which is like this, uh, you know, um, uh, which has a, the border of something like five, 400 miles uh, with Israel that goes comes very close to all of Israel's population centers. This would turn life in Israel uh, into a complete impossibility. Mm -hmm. Now, let me say something up front. As somebody who has been uh, a consistent uh, proponent of the uh, uh, two-state solution all along, I now think that we got a lot wrong. I think we were unempathic towards uh, the fears of Israelis. I think we kept kind of talking down on them. Don't you understand that Israel cannot remain a Jewish and democratic state, Jewish state in the sense of uh, a state with some kind of Jewish character uh, um, by democratic means if we don't uh, withdraw from the, 
from the West Bank. So, uh, so when you say we got something wrong, you mean you on the left who favored a two-state yes, solution in, yes. in, in the way you talked about it to other Israelis. In the way it, I think and what Israelis base that has turned the world left in Israel into a really uh, derogatory term. They say you guys are, are detached, you guys are arrogant, and you guys don't understand us, and we don't even you know, we don't want to listen to you anymore. And you see that, incidentally, in today's election campaign, uh, because there's something really funny, which is that no, no party except merits, uh, which is, uh, at this point has three mandates, is willing to call itself left. Everybody else makes a point to state we're center, so you have a map that, that, that is like, uh, you know, 60% right, 35% um, center, uh, then you have the Arab parties who are kind of out of the political game and like a left with of, of, of three out of 120 seats. And that, I think, is also is a result both of uh, Palestinians' aggression against Israel. Mm -hmm. I have time and again said that Palestinians, I think, have made dreadful mistakes. And meanwhile, by the way, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, has said that much a number of times. The second that the father was, I think, a fateful, fateful mistake by the, uh, by the Palestinians. And it's going to be very, very difficult to convince Israelis at this point to take risks for peace again. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think one way the trust problem, well, let me say, I think there's kind of two aspects to the trust problem, you know. Uh, you, you can either you can say you you can frame it as do you trust the Palestinians or do you trust Hamas? That's one question. Another question is I would say you know do you trust uh, in the malleability of of of, of human psychology and, and in a certain sense in the cynicism of uh, human motivation? By that I mean you know I am cynical in the sense that I believe people will change their ideological leanings to the extent that their ongoing quest for status and affirmation and power and whatever else dictates that they change their ideology. So in principle, if you can get the leaders of Hamas to see that their ongoing influence uh, has to entail a shift of, uh, of their policy, about the future of a Jewish state or whatever, I think in principle people are flexible enough for that, that to happen. And that's why my view is that sometimes when uh, people are saying don't engage with these various radicals and don't talk to them, I am, I would say, not, not trusting enough of them, but cynical enough about human nature to think that by, by, in the long run by manipulating the incentives you actually could get them to change. So I'd say there's, you know, uh, I, I think in a way that's what really divides, it, it's almost that the people who disagree with me have a kind of essentialist view of people, right? They yeah. think you are yeah. possessed by this ideology the way people are possessed by Satan. Barring an exorcism will never change, you know, you'll never change. Whereas in general, you can point to politicians in any nation, certainly including Bibi Netanyahu, and show how the things they say actually change depending on what, you know, what is opportunistic at the, at the moment. So, okay, let, let, let me first say the following. I basically agree with you. I think, you know, first of all, I think there is a, there is a hierarchy of human needs. In the end, uh, people primarily uh, need and want safety, and they want a sense of belonging, and uh, they also need meaning, and they need something, you know, that uh, uh, gives them a general map of, of the world. But that map, of course, will change according to the more, more basic needs. This being said, let me say, say two things. I have been, you know, uh, part of uh, one of the world's leading terrorism uh, research groups for the last eight years. And we have very good information about what was going on in uh, very close connections to what was going on in Palestinian society, including Hamas. And let me tell you that there is no doubt that they have at this point not changed anything of their ideology. Um, and I don't think that will uh, that will happen. That's when we, for example, confronted them with the question of whether they would be willing to change the part in their charter that is copy paste from the protocols of the elders of Zion. Right. Uh, 
the answer, by the way, was, well, you know, the Zionists wrote that, and, uh, and why shouldn't we use it? And when we confronted them with the fact that it's, uh, it's, it's a well-known forgery, they tended not to believe that. So you have, you, there is a problem with the other side. This being said, when we'll get to the pragmatic questions, I have views about how Hamas can be turned around. I have absolutely, and I uh, absolutely agree with you that basically it can hopefully create um, uh, uh, a constellation which in, in, in Israel, you see this very clearly, because in Israel, the percentage of people who are willing to partition Jerusalem is clearly a function of the, uh, how many people in Israel believe that a, an agreement, a viable agreement with the Palestinians can be reached. The less they believe in it, the less they're willing to partition Jerusalem. And then, of course, it's ideologized. It's, it's because it's the heart of uh, Jewish history, and because we get, if, we, if we give that up, then the whole Zionist enterprise has no meaning, blah, 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 blah. But th those very same people, when they believed in the possibility for peace, were willing to partition uh, Jerusalem. So I think that uh, I basically agree with you that ideology, if you, look, if you want, is kind of the superstructure. Yes, yes, I have a Marxist view of, of this, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, and so you said you have your views about how Hamas can be turned around. Well, uh, okay, I'm on the edge of my seat. Um, well, I'm not going to hear anything you haven't heard from me and that you don't know. You see, I, I am also, first I want to say that, even though I have written about this already many years ago, I'm at this point also part of a group that actively tries to promote this agenda. Uh, our assumption is that uh, a bilateral approach between Israel and Palestine will not, uh, will not lead to a, uh, to a positive result. And our baseline is that uh, any viable agreement will have to be regional. And our starting point is what used to be called the Saudi Peace Initiative. It started as the Saudi Peace Initiative in 2002. It was later ratified by uh, the Arab League. It has, by the way, by the way been re-ratified in August 2012, half a year ago. Mm -hmm. What this states basically is that if uh, Israel was crossed to the 1967 borders, if uh, um, there will be a Palestinian state within those borders, uh, including East Jerusalem as its capital, uh, all Arab countries will rec fully recognize Israel, reach full diplomatic relationships, uh, uh, relations, and uh, normalize its relations with Israel in general. Now that is a quite fascinating for the following reason. That's kind of, you know, if you look at the songs that were sung in Israel since 1980, 1948, since the state was established, half of them were about when there will finally be peace. Mm -hmm. And now comes the stunning thing. Fully 92% of Israelis do not know what the Arab League Peace uh, Initiative is. Mm -hmm. And it's been, like other research groups I'm part of, we've been trying to figure out how, how is that possible, including, by the way, because uh, the uh, Israel Peace Initiative, which is kind of this counterpart I'm part of, um, and together with uh, the Palestinian Authority, we've done, for example, a huge PR uh, attempt about one and a half years ago, trying to make Israelis aware of uh, the Arab uh, uh, League Peace Initiative, and that has changed. And you see, as, as a psychodynamic psychologist, uh, when I look at the research data and the paradox that doesn't filter in, I think what you see is really that Israelis are so deeply scarred from previous uh, attempts to hope for peace and actually open up for it, mm -hmm. that they shield themselves from any information that um, kind of tries to break through a certain defensive shield they've built. Mm -hmm. A shield which is, uh, and there is ongoing research on that, which shows that the Israelis have kind of moved into uh, a state in which they say conflict is the basic way of life here. And we have to live with that. Right. 
The Israelis feel that if, if, if they're going to they're gonna loosen up this, this tense muscle, it's just too dangerous. It's too dangerous militarily, and it's too dangerous psychologically. No, it seems part of the national identity. I mean, we're surrounded by enemies who will always hate us, right? I mean, that's the message I kind of get from a lot of is Israelis. Is that is that do you think I'm reading them wrong? No, no. You're, I mean, you're, and, and they are surrounded by enemies. That part's true, but it's the they will always hate us. That well, may or may not be true, but it's certainly decisive in terms of how it directs your policies. You know. Uh, look, uh, let, let me put it this way. I, I also have quite a bit of data uh, on, on research that's going on in Arab countries. Uh, most of the population around us, indeed, does not accept Israel's existence, and I think that one of the mistakes. Uh, of Israelis is that until they don't see, I'll put it somewhat melodramatically, signs of love uh, from the environment, they're not going to relax their defenses. And I think what we have not managed to get across at all is uh, the Arab League initiative has not is not based, uh, you know, on uh, on their uh, on, on on the Arab world having become Zionists. It's based on something very simple, which is that most regimes in the Arab world are more threatened by radical Islam than Israel is and the West is. And in addition to the fact that they're deeply, deeply scared of radical, uh, the radical Shiite movement, which is another problem stemming from Iran. Most of the actual radicalization is a Sunni radicalization. And they basically think that they need to build a moderate coalition that is, West, that is Western oriented. And they know that the Israel Palestine conflict is one of the strongest reasons why this can't happen. It also, the Israel Palestine conflict has kind of become the symbol of, the, of Islam's conflict with the West. So they think this needs to be taken care of. Um, now, how does all this link to Hamas? You see, I think if you get uh, the, all of the Arab League moving in this direction, you would basically take any strategic bet that Hamas has. Uh, and if Hamas would realize that it doesn't have any backing anymore for a more rejectionist view to uh, ideology, they will just, you know, take the turn that many other movements have, have taken as well, which is to just become, uh, you know, a political a part of the political process. But for that, you need a much larger, a much wider um, regional approach. You can't, you can't solve it by much. Do. But it also seems to me that you know something that is that many, I think, most Israelis most fear is is you know Hamas actually coming to power, possibly in the West Bank as well as Gaza, in a way that's recognized, right? being recognized as being in power and being spoken to as if they're the legitimate power. This terrifies Israelis, but it's possible that that is a necessary step in the, in the process by, by which uh, the incentives are rearranged, you know? I mean, because once you're actually running a place, and first of all, you know, there's something nice about being seen as legitimate, and you go to these international things, and you're important, and so on, and you want to you cling to that. And, and if you're... Uh, of course, and they would still have some international voices that were more important than others to them, and their patrons would certainly be important, which, interestingly, has now come to include uh, Qatar, uh, and is, 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 seems, seems to be less, less about Syria and Iran, more about Qatar and Egypt. Um, that's potentially promising. You know, and if your patrons uh, want, want peace, and I think ultimately both Qatar and, and Egypt do want stability, um, you know, maybe that's the way it happens, right? But I think Israel uh, is is reluctant, uh, if it can help it, you know, to permit Hamas. To, and I understand why, a, a, you know, a, a political party that claims to want the extinction of your form of government, you know, uh, the extinction of Zionism as a form of government, um, is, you know, it's not an appetizing prospect for them to assume power. But I think it's conceivable that, that 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 is the most plausible way that a good ending could come about? Well, uh, look, from what I know about peace processes, uh, it can never work if one of the major players is excluded. So it is clear that without, uh, since Hamas represents, let's say, ballpark one third of the Palestinian population, um, it is clear that at some point Hamas has to be included. 
And I think that uh, uh, the idea that you know Hamas has to kind of disappear from uh, from uh, uh, from political game is completely unrealistic. Uh, the problem is, I can tell you, that of, I know of many attempts to uh, get Hamas to change uh, its tune. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, these attempts haven't, you know, on background channel, in background channels. Uh, these. So far, none of this has really yielded much. Yeah, but I guess what I'm suggesting is maybe background ain't going to work, and you've got to take a kind of a leap of, of faith in the malleability of human psychology. But, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but... Uh... Well, let, let me... Look, look, I can tell you what's feasible in Israel politically and what isn't. Right. Okay? Now, what I'm saying is... Look, but the, the, I can tell you what, you what you can get from Hamas. What you can get from Hamas... Uh, and this has in the past been floated, uh, let's say, in op-eds in the New York Times around 2006, when uh, after Hamas was uh, was elected, uh, was you know take, uh, taken over the Palestinian Authority, is something they call Hudna, which is a uh, which is an Islamic concept, uh, which is quite serious. It's not just uh, let's say uh, a ceasefire. It's like a it can be a long-term attempt to uh, end hostilities for the foreseeable future. If we talk about 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and Israelis basically say, uh, okay, fine, 30 years, and then what? You'll start pumping us again? You know what? We just won't give it to you. But yeah, that's exactly what I mean. Is is I mean, hey, if you won't if you won't take thirty years as a working space in which you could possibly, you know, uh, you know, that's that's exactly what I mean. That's exactly what yeah. I mean. Uh, well, well, uh, uh, yeah. The point is like this. I think uh, I personally was in f I'm in favor uh, to go in this direction because I think you know thirty years is a long time. Thirty years would mean that you would have. A whole generation of Palestinians growing up, not under conditions of our, uh, occupation, and um, and uh, we, we would be in a very different ball game right. by then. Uh, I can just tell you, it's like no Israeli leader, yeah. no Israeli leader will be able to push that. Through. Israelis yeah. want to support. You know, and a, and a and a problem with 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 the alternative stance, which is to say, we're not moving until Hamas. You know, does A, B, and C, including recognize, you know, uh, the right of Israel as a Jewish state to exist, uh, you know, getting the guarantees up front, is that what's happening, the situation right now is working for Hamas. You know, the, the, uh, they get into a battle, and, 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 and this is, you know, one of, the, one of the gravest dynamics in world affairs is this non-zero-sum game between extremists. So you've got Netanyahu on the right, Hamas are the extremists, you know, and it works for both of them to be in conflict. It consolidates the power of extremists within their own societies for them to be in conflict with one another. Absolutely. And it could go on forever. Uh, uh, look, we, um, we see this exactly the same way. But I can tell you that, once again, if I look at what is feasible and what isn't, what isn't feasible, um, I think I can tell you what would work. I'll put it in, for, it, it, a certain type of psychodrama has to take place, and we have a precedent for that. Mm -hmm. When Sadat came to Israel in 1977, uh, I was briefly here during that time. And I can tell you that Israelis, all the streets in Israel were empty. Everybody, you know, Israel at that point only had like black and white TV and so one channel. And everybody, everybody was glued to their receivers. And it was like, you know, if the Martian, if Martians had landed at Ben Gurion Airport, it would have been less sensational and less kind of the unbelievable that's happening than so that actually traveling to groups. And so that, uh, first of all, because he, he put his head on one. Uh, by the way, it turned out literally. I mean, he was killed for uh, he was killed for for it later on by members of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, the organization that nowadays uh, heads uh, as political power in Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was something that really spoke to Israelis, and they were willing to give up every inch of the Sinai. And the Sinai was also a security buffer for Israel. 
the complete security of. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think I can tell you what the the um, analogous psychodrama would be now. You see, in the past, we've tried when when we tried to introduce the uh, uh, the uh, Arab League peace initiative to Israelis, we made a mistake. We uh, brought Jordanians and Egyptians to explain it. So they really said that those are not real Arabs. Those are, those are Westernized Arabs. I think the only believable thing would be if somebody like, uh, you know, the member of the Royal House of Saudi were to come to Jerusalem and actually say this to the Israeli people. Say, look, we have a genuine belief that this has to happen. And we know that for you this is frightening, but we will be an integral part of helping you to go through this process of uh, establishing a peaceful order in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to say it in a funny way. You need somebody who looks Arab in, 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 in the stereotypical uh, sense of the term. But both you and I know that all these essentialist constructions have very little validity, but they have psychological validity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that... Uh, I'm not sure that uh, a member... A member of the Royal House of Saud at this point would do it. I can tell you that we've been involved in background negotiations for Saudis on a somewhat lower level to uh, do something of the sort, even just write an op ed in an Israeli newspaper. They said yes, and they always back down in the last minute. So there is the problem is on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other side doesn't, you know, they, they ratify. Uh, those agreements on the one hand, and then they're un they're incapable un or unwilling. I think they're both uh, to actually come and communicate directly with the Israeli people and say, "This is what we believe, and this is what we're going to do." Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I think there are explanations for, for why they always back down. Um, I think uh, one candidate that might be more realistic is, is the Emir of Qatar. Uh, I'm not divulging any terrible secrets here. Because, I mean, Israel has no, uh, has no diplomatic relations with Qatar, but there is very strong um, cooperation on, uh, on um, uh, combating uh, Islamist uh, radicalism with them. Uh, Qatar is very interested. The reason Qatar is trying to rebuild Gaza now is because they want to calm the situation down. Now, I don't know, I can't tell you that I believe or know or anything of that sort that the Emir of Qatar would be willing to come to Jerusalem and speak to the Knesset. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, as long as Bibi is in power, I think he'll do everything he can to prevent that mm -hmm. because it would be against his own ideology. But if you ask me what kind of move could break this deadlock, uh, this is what could do the job. And I think it's very important for uh, the American administration uh, to take that into account because this game of trying to get Israelis and Palestinians back to negotiations has become a totally useless, um, ex futile exercise in, in, in dead end diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's hope. If I if I run into the Emir, I will I will lobby on your behalf. The uh, let me let me just before we uh, sign off, change channels a little. Yeah, go but, ahead. Say one thing. I, I psychodramatized this a little bit, and, uh, but this is far less outlandish than it sounds because sure. basically you have signed documents by the Arab League that says this. There is an interesting question that you need to ask yourself. Why uh, are they incapable of coming out much more clearly in a more public way to, to make clear, what, to, to, to assert what they have signed? Mm -hmm. There is an internal error problem as well. But what I'm talking about is not science fiction. It's something that needs a concerted um, effort. And I think the only, uh, the only player who has the clout to actually move this forward is, of course, the United States. But I think they've been. They, I think the United States has taken has tackled this problem from the wrong end in the last uh, the last ten years or so. Well, speaking of the United States, uh, 
Uh, I'm wondering, uh, has this, uh, you know, one, one of the big stories here right now is this, uh, the nomination of Chuck Hagel to be Secretary of Defense, and he's encountering resistance on grounds, well, for example, that he favored engagement with Hamas, uh, to get back to something we were talking about earlier. He used the phrase Jewish lobby instead of Israel lobby uh, five years ago or something. Is, is, this, uh, is this thing making a very big splash in Israel? Are you guys paying attention to this? Uh, yeah, it, it is. I don't know how much, you know, run of the mill Israelis uh, follow this uh, because I don't know, you know, except for who's the president, I don't know how much uh, they understand about it. I think in the elites it's very much uh, seen as a significant step because it also shows, uh, you know, I think Bibi has, uh, that's how we call him, Benjamin Netanyahu. It's his nickname. Totally. He's a very uh, familiar uh, figure here uh, now. Uh, Bibi, uh, Bibi obviously miscalculated very, very grossly, and I think you know one of Bibi's major weaknesses is that he thinks he has Israel, he has the United States figured out. There is a, there is a, uh, there is a video uh, that was taken when he was uh, when he was not in politics, where first he explains to settlers how he killed the Oslo process, and then he says, you know, this was, you know, the Americans are easy; they can be turned around to do the right thing. Right. And I think he has this theory that the liberal elites in the United States are, the, are a thin crust, and you just have to kind of uh, you kind of have to work with uh, on the right level, and then no American president uh, will be able to. He pressure. may be right about that, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, incidentally, historically speaking, um, the one president who really uh, said, "You know what? You're not going to tell me what to do." was George Bush the father. Mm -hmm. And he had a representative, he sent Jim Baker here, mm -hmm. and Jim Baker kind of was really not impressed by anything. I think it's in a sense easier for a Republican president with a Texan foreign as Secretary of State who is like six foot three and, uh, and a hard-boiled lawyer and not so much a diplomat, right. it's, it's probably easier for, for, um, for this kind of constellation than to do it but for a pen. For somebody like Obama, who will you know, uh, you know, and carry you who believe I think in, in more diplomatic ways of doing this. But I think first of all, Obama's nomination of Hegel is, in addition to uh, you know the great office credentials for the job, is also a clear sign that the United States will do what it sees in its own interest. Mm -hmm. And I think the Israeli elites realize that this is a, uh, an important step. Uh, I still think, I still think that uh, Obama, um, Obama, you know, mishandled um, all of this in the first in his first term completely. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying, I say this, by the way, with enormous admiration and respect for the man's achievements in other uh, respects, and I, uh, I greatly appreciate his worldview. It's not, this is not meant as a criticism of Obama as Obama. Personally, I was thrilled that he was uh, re-elected. Um, but I really hope that uh, they will take a more systemic approach out of, you know, a systemic approach that's based on what we actually see from heart from hard social science data, very little of what I say is speculative. So what should it's, he do? What should he What should he do? I think what he should do before he goes back to this is, you know, okay, let's get the two of you together. He should work on uh, trying to get uh, a really major representative of the Arab League. Um, to uh, engage, or major representatives, mm -hmm. to engage in a massive PR campaign that makes clear that they actually mean, that they actually are committed mm -hmm. to uh, their own initiative. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways, you know, of, of thinking of how to go about this, and I think that would prepare the grounds. Israelis would feel something is happening in the area as a whole. Because you see, you have to understand Israeli's existential experience. Palestinians is like, okay, they're, they're, this is a small territory. And then you have thousands of kilometers of states that so far have no um, 
uh, uh, no uh, diplomatic relations with you. We have in '91. We were we were bombarded by Scud or uh, rockets from Iraq. Uh, Israelis basically see all of this like as this huge menacing mm -hmm. space, and that space needs to be transformed into something human, into something with faces, and into something with clear voices that say, we want peace with you, and we'll be willing to truly cooperate with you on a, a regional peace settlement. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I suspect that some of these, uh, you know, whether the Emir of, of Qatar or anyone else, I suspect the one thing they might say in response is, Frankly, looking at the direction of the government in Israel and the direction of Israeli politics, we don't consider this an auspicious time. They also, separate from that, of course, uh, as reflected in their their uh, the fact that they've never done this before, they have their own domestic political constraints, I'm sure. And, and, and it's, one, it's one thing for them to whisper to other to Western elites, yes, we could live with a Jewish state. It's another thing for them to broadcast that to the Arab masses when many of them have gotten quite a bit of political mileage out of opposition to the spirit of opposition to Zionism. So, so I mean, there's, you know... You know, uh, that, that, is what, that, that is part of the problem. You right. have to realize that Israel... Look, just, you know, there was this little item lately on, uh, on Israeli TV. Uh, they discovered uh, um, peppers made and grown in Israel in a Lebanese supermarket. They brought in the army to take out those, to take out those, those, uh, those peppers, you know, like, what, what are they going to do there? Are they going to question those peppers on, on, but you see, in terms of the symbolism, like, you know, all the horror, Israeli grown peppers, which had been imported by mistake from Spain, right? So yeah, what, what you have to see is that Israelis, and, you know, Lebanon, don't forget, I mean, Lebanon has no dispute with Israel, okay? Um, most of the... Uh, no, territorial, territorial dispute. Territorial dispute, okay, yeah. Okay, so what Israelis say is, look, we don't believe, we don't believe in any of this if we don't see any movement around. All we see is, you know, we have the Muslim Brotherhood now in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, in Syria, we don't know who's going to who is going to be in charge in a year from now. Uh -huh. We don't know who will be in charge in Lebanon, and you guys want us to take risks when the whole area is in upheaval, and basically, you know, all of them uh, make uh, most of their official noises are uh, that the Zionist entity is uh, is is like this 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 uh, a cancer in the middle of uh, of the Arab world. Um, so, I think that one really has to realize the systemic problem and do something about that if you expect Israelis to. This is not a matter of, I'm not talking values to you now, okay? I have very strong reasons to believe that if Israel doesn't get out of the West Bank soon, that basically, you know, uh, is the, the project of Israel as the Jewish homeland is in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. um, my question, you know, as a social scientist who looks at the data and has some background information is how do you use that background information in order to do something productive? Because I completely understand your point of view. Your point of view is, look, Israelis have to do something in order to help uh, Arab leaders to do that because it's very complicated for Arab leaders to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, completely, I'm completely aware of that. Okay, I mean, I have spoken to a number of Qatari officials because I was in conference in Qatar about a year ago. Uh, and, um, uh, and I want to make clear, by the way, that what I said uh, about the Emir of Qatar coming here is not based on any inside information or anything that I gathered. Well, it's, there. A, it's a good rumor to start. Let's, let's start the rumor. Yeah, yeah I know. But no, I, I think, you know, it's, it's not, uh, uh, I don't believe in spins of that sort. Uh, I just say what I think, if I look dryly at the situation and try to make use of whatever knowledge I have, that pretty much seems to me the only uh, uh, fruitful okay. way to go. Now you alluded to uh, the, I, I keep saying this the last question, maybe this one will be, uh, you alluded to the uh, 
you know, the, the, the prospect that if, 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 uh, if Israel stays in the West Bank much longer, and I think you, you mean and continues to build settlements especially, uh, the project of Zionism will be doomed. You know, my own view, we need to argue this, my own view is that that point has probably been, been, been passed. But, uh, you know, given what it would take even now to extricate the settlers who would have to be extricated in the standard version of the two-state solution, given the amount of political will and determination in Israel it would take and how far Israeli politics seems to be from that and so on. But let me just ask you this. We, we, we both agree at least that there is some point beyond which it will be too late for the two-state solution, whether or not we're there yet. Is, is, a, one, is a benign one-state solution conceivable to you? Is it conceivable that you could have a binational state, however hard it was to, to work out, where you had Palestinians and Israelis living in, in peace under a one-state solution? Well, let me first say, you know, I've published a number of pieces in which I said that I think uh, the two-state solution is dead. Uh, and part of it was because I really see, it. as you just said, it's becoming close to impossible to implement it already now. I must admit that one of the reasons I wrote, wrote that was as kind of a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. And the reason is very simple. Look, uh, you know, uh, you certainly know Benedict Anderson's classic, you know, Imagine Communities, right. um, uh, which is, you know, what, what, how do nations really function? Nations unite around narratives and, about, and around symbols. Now, you know, I, sometimes, you know, um, people, um, uh, friends of mine who are much more to the left than I am and believe that this is the only viable, that the one state solution is the only viable and just uh, way of going about this. I always ask them very simple questions. Okay, uh, what's going to be the spoken language in Parliament and what is going to be the flag and what is going to be the anthem? Like, you know, the Israel, for Israelis to give up their anthem, which is about, you know, the hope of the Jewish people to come back, it's kind of very difficult for me to imagine, uh, you know, a Palestinian MPs singing that anthem. Now, do you expect, uh, like, uh, uh, Israelis to, uh, Jewish Israelis to sing an anthem that talks about the Palestinian yearning to go to come back to Jaffa? It's like, uh, on, on, the, on the level of how could such a state conceivably function? I can just not see how it will. It may, we may very well end up uh, with a one-state reality, and then it will take you know, it will take decades for that to turn into something that functions politically um, on the most basic level. So my fear is that I don't think there is a one-state solution. There can be a one-state reality that then will have to be worked out. Uh, but I think we still have to hang on, you know, uh, for whatever it's worth, uh, to the last shreds of, uh, of uh, the last little possibilities to salvage uh, the two-state solution, because that will actually be a solution. So you can imagine a kind of a muddling through toward eventual stability under one one state. I, uh... Look, I, 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 wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to tell you how this would work out. You know, pro, it might go through intermediary stages of confederative cantons, but, uh, you know, until there would be a viable political superstructure, um, uh, it would take uh, ages. Now, but basically, you know, sorry to say that it was being one of... Uh, uh, the Palestinians uh, leading the peace uh, peace proponents for for decades has basically told in his latest book, you know, what the, what this was called what is what is a Palestinian state worth? That um, that the idea of a Palestinian state should be abandoned, and that he's, and he also said it will take decades and decades in which Palestinians will not have full, full political rights. Now that may be what will actually happen. It's not something I would be looking forward to, to say the least. That would presumably have some parallels with the South African situation, where once it is once it is recognized as truly in effect a single state, you start getting international pressure to give the to give the Palestinians rights as they acquire. I guess what you kind of hope is that as they gradually acquire political power, 
both sides realize that, you know, the, the worst option is civil war, and they both use the political mechanisms to work with something yeah, Basically, I think the, the scenario that you're alluding to is that there will be, like, if, if, uh, the moment that there is the, the euro annexation of the West Bank, uh, international pressure will kind of force Israel at some point uh, into giving uh, the Palestinians uh, political rights. But that is a scenario. It's, I think, a very bad scenario. And it's also a scenario that the end product of which is not something that will be either very good for the Palestinians or very good for the Jews uh, that live here. You know, I, I, I try, believe me, I have looked at a number of models of how such a state might function. I'm very pessimistic about its prospects, but, uh, you know, the ping pong that you alluded to before between Hamas and Israel is right. This mutual empowerment of the extremists may actually lead to the point where this might be our reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's probably not the most inspiring note we could have left it on, but... Uh... I, I, I know I don't we'll leave it on that. No. I seriously look. I know that I, I don't think that, that Obama and Kerry and Hegel uh, probably structured their uh, policies on uh, what they said on, on 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 this program. I seriously think that since the United States is committed to a two-state solution, it needs to change its tactics and it needs to do so on a reasoned basis and a reasoned understanding of the regional problems and possibilities that are there, that's maybe the last chance that we still have. Okay. Well, then we will hope that uh, that they are watching and that the Emir of uh, Qatar is watching as well. Uh, and on the Internet, they could be. Who knows? So thanks. Thanks, Carlo. Great conversation as always. And uh, Thanks. It was a pleasure. As usual. All right. Take care.